Yeah, you want to go ahead and play? Go ahead and do it. Yeah, go ahead. No point. Okay, everybody. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get started with the uh, the grower panel this afternoon. So if y'all would please uh, take a seat and think of some good questions along the way. Oh, you're a good you're a good man. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, looking forward to um, asking our, our panel some questions uh, this afternoon. And uh, we've got a really good uh, panel of, uh, of individuals here that have a lot of experience with cover crops, and they're going to share some things with you. So be thinking of some questions as we go along. And I'm going to start off uh, just Asking each of you, if you would, just please uh, introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your operation and uh, how long you've been doing cover crops, and then we'll kind of go from there. So we've got two mics up there. Probably help if you if you use those. So they should be on. Okay. Yeah. Go right ahead, Keith. You can start. All right. Thank you. I have brought a dog and pony show with me. All right. <laughs> Windmills. <laughs> yeah. Keith Thompson, I'm from Osage City, Kansas, between Topeka and Emporia, Kansas. Uh, Eastern Kansas, about a 34 inch rainfall situation. <coughs> Get all these things lined out. Farm with my, my son and my brother. Get them laid out so I can see them. Uh, then, you know, I started off tilling the ground. I've done every kind of tilling thing you can possibly think of. I've tried every trick you can do farming to make money. I was right up front say cover crops the only thing that's actually worked in the long run. Uh, we grow, I, I said farm with my brother and my son Ben. Uh, we uh, grow, you know, corn, soybeans, sunflowers, wheat, lots of, just, just a variety of crops. Uh, I was lucky I got to go on the first no on the Plains bus trip to see Dr. Dwayne Beck. And uh, I remember standing up there in the field listening to him talking about diversity and intensity and rotations and, and how that adds profitability to farm. And I, I turned to my son and I said, this crazy guy's half right. We're going to start making money. And he was more <laughs> than half right. And on that trip, I got to meet some interesting people. One in the back of the room, I see Paul Yossa. Got to visit him a lot. If you ever get a chance to go to either Dr. Beck's farm or go to see Paul's at Roger Memorial Farm, I recommend you want doing that. They're really great. But Paul's deal in the summer for his tour, for his cover crops tour. That's that's a good one. Anyway, talk about this. We put a lot of words out there: virginity farming, uh, holistic farming, um, a renaissance of farming. A system, I, I try to look at things as a system. So I was on a trip, uh, 2017, went around the world and did some talking. And uh, we were down in uh, Australia, it was out in the middle of the field, and the gentleman was telling us what he was doing, and he's telling all what he's doing, and he goes, uh, my rotation is da, da, da. And Paul stands back there and goes, uh, no, no, that's not a rotation. That's an oscillation. You're not rotating. You're just planting two crops in the same series. And my friend Rick Beaver had been using this uh, slide, and this was the slide. And he, this is one of those deals that's drawn on a in a bar, trying to explain what's going on to people. And it's pretty simple. It's just Paul had kind of the same uh, up there on his deal with the deal. Have cool season grasses, warm season grasses. Warm season broadleaves, cool season broadleaves. And Rex was just trying to show that when you went this way or this way, using them and planting them in your cover crops, you didn't have problems with diseases and insects and things because when you went this way, you would have problems uh, or up and down. And so Rick said, when Paul said that, he sat up all night thinking, how can I show this? So I'm gonna do that a little quick to Dog and Pony Show, so this is the sun, all right? I really wanted to get one that squirted water because we have sunlight, water, and CO2, and a green plant photosynthesis 
All energy on earth comes from that. So this is what Rick was trying to show. So, uh, so we got the sun, we'll get it started up running. So remember Rick said that when you're kind of going this way or this way, when you're cover crops, you won't see as many disease problems. So that was, this was Rick's, this is the going crossway. You see that wants to turn pretty good. But it don't turn real fast. There's a problem, we've got to add stuff in our farm. And that's what I discovered also. And this is the one that uh, pretty consistent around here. This is corn and soybean rotation or whatever you want. It just doesn't want to spin. We've got to add inputs on our farm to make this work. We'll turn the fan up and they'll get to turn it. I want you to notice how it shakes. And that's the problems we see out there. Uh, we see uh, herbicide resistance. We see bug problems and all that. That's caused by that going on. The other one that we see all the time is a monocrop. And that, uh, that won't turn at all. Even if I turn the fan on, it doesn't like to turn. And that can be, you know, we think more crop OT. Soybeans, we think corn. But how about you hate the field? The same way, every year at the same time, you pick up out for just a certain kind of grass and your yields go down in your hay. And another monocrop we don't think about is your yard. And this is what Rick was trying to show with all four of them spinning nice and smooth. And when I went up to Dwayne Bex, he said we needed to add another crop into our system. And that, so this was my third crop. And they don't turn too good unless I get, I start adding more fertilizer and chemicals and everything to get that, that running. And what, one of the other things that I, when I, this in our farm, when we went to, on a trip, Dwayne Beck has to go to Argentina to study long-term breaks. And my son got infatuated with cattle down there. My whole life, I tore out fences. I filled in ponds. My son goes with us. We take on this tour in South America to study, and he come back and added cattle. And when I added cattle into our system, I saw our system take off. It started running a lot smoother. One more. This is what we're really trying to do: get our soil ecology in our on our farm, our above ecology running smoother, and get that get our pinwheel running smooth on our farm. Been planting cover crops for over 20 some years. I, I come here and I, I, I told Candy Thomas, I listened to people talking, I'm like, well, I never know that was a problem. Because we started planting cover green back in the 90s and I didn't even know there was a word for it. But that's a little story about why we started. Was I'm, all I'm trying to do is get this pinwheel going and I'm trying to get away from either this one or any of them, but trying to just our farm, we're trying to get our kid goes go smooth. All right, thank you, Keith. Sean? Well, I'm Sean Tiffany. Uh, my brother and I own and operate a custom cattle finishing operation. Uh, one facility is about 145 miles west of here, near Council Grove, Harrington, Kansas area. And then our second facility is another 70 miles west of that, uh, near Mar the McPherson area. And we do a considerable amount of farming in our operations, uh, a lot of cover crop grazing started. We, our farms have primarily been no-till since uh, around 2000 in the Morris County area and only no-till for two and a half years in McPherson County. I was told when we moved, moved to McPherson County, you can't no-till there. And I said, well, just sit back and watch me. It is tough in the sandy soil out there, but. Uh, we graze a lot of cover crops and Flint Hills grass. We'll graze 10 months out of the year and uh, have continuous root and soil throughout the year and just working on getting less and less dependent on inputs as we possibly can. Uh, my name is Michael Willis. Um, I live in King City, Missouri. It's just about an hour north of here. And uh, I farm with my dad and my brother. We grow uh, mostly corn, soybeans, but you know, after going to a lot of these uh, soil health meetings and learning more about it and doing things with cover crops, we've started incorporating more with uh, small grains back into our rotation. Uh, we usually always try to uh, grow um, a lot of our own cover crop seed, especially where the bulk of what we use is going to be something like cereal rye or been using a lot more triticale just to kind of help keep seed costs down. 
also to uh, help just diversify our rotation and then you know that opens up the window for more diverse mixes that then we can graze in the winter um, uh, we also uh, run a cow calf herd um, some spring calvers some fall calvers so uh, gives us plenty of opportunities to uh, graze on those cover crops uh, when possible and uh, you know in the past we'd always kind of manage a lot of our winter cover crops kind of how we did um, just our stock ground in the past uh, just turn the cows out over the winter and just let them have the run of it. You know, we'd still see a lot of hay savings. Um, past couple of years, we've been doing a lot more with trying to do more um, intensive grazing, uh, you know, daily moves and things like that, and uh, had seen a, a lot of benefit of that. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Steffen. I live in southeast Nebraska, in the, in the southeast corner of Nebraska at Humboldt. My wife, Paula Sue, is here. And she and I run a dairy farm, and we're, we're 150 cow uh, dairy operation, a diversified farm. So uh, we raise corn, soybeans, and some wheat, dry land, um, produce hay. We cut silage, uh, corn silage for our dairy. So that opens up an opportunity uh, for a longer growing season after that for some cover crop opportunities, as well as um, planting wheat in our rotation also gives us some opportunities there. Great. Well, we'll start, Ben, with you, and we'll kind of go back the other way this time. And just, just tell us, uh, uh, I think a couple of you touched on to this, but um, what was it that, you know, made you want to get into cover crops, or how and why did you, did you get started with cover crops? I guess I'll mention that uh, my parents started no-tilling back in the 70s, and so when Paul Sue and I started in the operation, we continued that, and, and we started adding some cover crops really before we kind of knew what that was into the acres where we cut corn silage. And um, so that was just a natural progression. I, I, I'm guessing we've been putting something on those silage acres for 20 plus years, 20, 30, I don't know exactly. A good, good long time before we really understood what we were beginning to do. When we finally, I think we had a CSP contract at some point that really kind of, got, kind of gave us a kickstart to, to using cover crops. But very shortly as we started into that, we, we went way beyond the requirements of that contract. And so we try to put cover crops on pretty much every acre that we can. Thank you, um, It's kind of the same deal with uh, me and my family's farm. Uh, Mom and dad, once they moved out to the home place in the mid 80s, you know, they started no-tilling. So a lot of our fields have been no-tilled, um, you know, since around 85, 86, when they were out that way. And um, then in 2012, that fall was the uh, first uh, cover crop that we had planted following corn. It was cereal rye following corn before soybeans, a you know, pretty good typical way to get used to doing cover crops. And uh, I think for me, I mean, it was one that dad just, you know, being interested in soil conservation, we'd always done things like terraces, you know, we didn't want erosion, you know, we kind of have gently rolling hills, don't like seeing those ephemeral gullies and things like that forming. So anything that we can do to stop erosion, we're like, hey, we're, we're game, we, we want to do it. And, uh, and uh, up at college, uh, the uh, soil fertility professor I had, uh, Jamie Patton, she did a really good job of kind of which is kind of when folks started promoting more on cover crops, the biology below the ground, she kind of drove that point home. I thought, all right, there might be a point to this. So after I got done with that, came back home to the farm. He, dad was interested, mom was interested, I was interested. So we figured let's give it a stab. And we were pleased with that first batch and just kind of increased our acres to where, you know, if we're planting soybeans, we don't want to be planting them into something that's not covered. You know, we, we want to have a cover crop for those beans because we just see so many benefits. Great. Thank you, Michael. Well, my story is probably considerably different than most people. I don't come from a long line of farmers. I come from a long line of cattlemen. And uh, bought our first cattle operation, and it came with a farm. And so somebody had to learn to farm. And then it was just three years after that, or less than, that I attended a field day on cover crops and could quickly see the value in it, the value in our operation from many different angles, but particularly just an opportunity to create another line of business in a custom cattle feeding operation and try to help our, our business survive. And uh, it flowed out of that uh, into, you know, summer annuals, uh, 
you know, inter, intercropping, uh, blending in our cash crops in, in where, where it made sense, and just looking at it from every angle of the operation. And I guess the reason that's different is, or we were willing to adopt that, is I don't, I didn't have dad's voice or grandpa's voice whisper in my ear. That's not the way we do this. I, you know, I was, I was pretty open-minded because I was a blank slate. So I considered that to have been an, an advantage for me. Uh, we started for, what, I think Paul had the first one on his slide, erosion control. And when we did no tilling, you get lots of residue on the ground, heavy rains, it wash. And uh, I remember I was down on the creek one after it flooded and it piled residue up and I planted corn and washed the corn out. And, and it's been 10 years of no till, a little strip about that wide in the corn. My son said that never happened again. We started planting covers on that farm and it's been plant has something growing on it all the time. My second reason we did it was for uh, to dry out the soil in the spring. Uh, just so I could get planted sooner. And the then we just sort of slowly morphed into growing seed and planting perennials for grazing and things like that. Great. Well, thank you, Keith. A lot of different answers there. You know, definitely uh, there's uh, a lot of different reasons to get into cover crops and, and to stay in them. So um, things don't always go perfectly. Uh, you know, so Keith, we'll start with you, but uh, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made around cover crops? <laughs> we'll just, we'll just, let's leave it for cover crops. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Biggest mistake um, is, I guess, we didn't move forward as fast as we sh should have when we saw things improving. I had a brother that absolutely fought us, and he fought us only because of what the people at the coffee shop was telling him. But to give him a, a kadu, he walked in the shop one day. Remember, this was after we had asked him not to spray cover crops and kill them before we plant, and a lot. He was killing things so my son couldn't graze. He walks in the shop one morning. We're sitting there trying to have our morning discussion. He says, "We're planting more cover crops." It was like, "Yeah, we've been trying to talk you into letting us do that." And he said, "You don't understand. There's no weeds where you guys plant cover crops." And he's a spray guy. He was killing at that time. And he had decided that if he didn't have spray so much, he could go more golfing. <laughs> well, I, I alluded to this for those of you that, that heard me speak earlier today. I don't, I don't feel like we've ever had a single cover crop failure. Um, we've had some instances where we didn't get to utilize the crop for what I intended it for. Maybe we had planted it to graze and we just had a cool wet fall to where it didn't grow or uh, various things like that, but there's always a backup plan and backup options. I used to say that uh, the argument that cover crops don't utilize all your moisture just doesn't hold water. I had to take that slide out of my presentation in 2018, but in 18 months uh, from late 17 into the harvest season of 18, we uh, had a third of our annual rainfall over the course of 16 or 18 months. and that was the only time in my cover crop career where we did see a yield reduction in cover crops compared to fallow ground, uh, but we just had zero rain. So no matter how healthy your soils are, you're still dependent on rain to a certain degree, but I feel like in our systems, we're not nearly as dependent as our neighbors are. Good. Um, I'd say if we were to have anything that would be a failure, it would be probably that very first year when we started doing cover crops, the, like the beans after the cereal rye, um, you know, that was a huge success and it definitely sold us on cover crops. Uh, we also had some ground that was in uh, wheat the previous year and uh, we did like a mix of, I think it was rye, crimson clover, Austrian winter pea, um, I think it had some radishes, turnips, canola, and uh, we were going to corn the next year and we thought, all right, well, we have some legumes in here. There's maybe five pounds of Austrian winter pea, three pounds of crimson clover. We thought, all right, we're gonna go whole turkey on nit nitrogen and gonna get all our nitrogen from this cover crop. It's gonna be great. And it didn't supply the nitrogen that we needed. It, 
of the corn it got growing and it came up and it was spindly yellow you know it needed a little extra shot of something it needed a little extra nitrogen and so that you know kind of showed us that hey you can't just you know it's not a magic bullet where you can just say oh we're going to do our cover crops and then we don't have to do any inputs whatsoever but over the years we've definitely noticed uh, we've been putting a lot less p and k out there so we have been able to draw down those inputs but it wasn't just flip a magic switch and now well you can just stick a seed in the ground grows and everything's hunky-dory <coughs> we've had plenty of challenges and i, I like sean's response i the, the think i think uh, the thing in our experience is that i think you need to be prepared to change your plans and you need to be able to respond to whatever happens in the season We've had we've done quite a bit of aerial seeding with with rye in the fall into standing corn. Uh, we we did that in soybeans on at least one occasion, and uh, on that particular field it came up great. And but by the time we got ready to combine the soybeans, that rye was tall enough that we clipped it with the with the, with the combine, and it boy that that was a little slow, it slowed you down combining. You don't like feeding rye through bean stubble when you're combining. Uh, but it looked like a golf green when we got done. It was that was nice. But that timing if you're doing that in soybeans is a little challenging. I think one of the other, you know, that we only did that once, so you learn, right? Um, we've done aerial seeding with quite a bit of success. I mean southeast Nebraska, but there have been some years where it's been inconsistent. And you always have trouble we've always had trouble with uh, coordinating with an applicator and and I've, I'm pretty close friends with him. Whether that helped or not, I, I, I'm not sure. But so, and, and one of the things that I think uh, that we have a challenge with is the termination. Um, I think not having our own sprayer is a choice we've made. And this is one of the problems with not having your own sprayer. The timing, the, the conditions um, is always a challenge. Last year we had a number of acres that were prevent planted and some that were failed and we planted a mixture of things in some of those acres. Some of that involved sun hemp, some quite a bit of involved sedan. And we thought we were going to, you know, make hay or we were going to make silage off of that. And it then we got a whole boatload of rain. We couldn't get in the fields and it just got we got overwhelmed. But we changed our plans. We did get it harvested and we've got a tremendous pile of feed. So you just have to be ready to change your plans. Very good. Well, I'll start then with you and go back and then be thinking of some questions because uh, uh, we'll open it up to the audience. But um, so all four of you uh, influence a lot of people and uh, leaders in your area. Um, when somebody asks you uh, about cover crops that's not tried it, what, what advice would you give them to, to get started? I think there are just tons of opportunities around cover crops. And there are so many opportunities, we can't run fast enough to get around all of them and to take advantage of them all. We do not graze anything with our dairy and our cover crops. I just can't, I just, there's so many, I just can't get to it. But I think there are many, many opportunities with cover crops. So if you're a young guy, young, young gal, you wanna get started in agriculture, you know, start with a custom operation planting cover crops. Plenty of people don't want to take time, haven't, haven't gotten one to, to do it themselves. You know, do the custom work, uh, supply the seed. Um, there are, you know, if you don't have livestock in your operation, partner with somebody who does. If you don't have fences, a lot of those people are prepared to build them and graze cattle. And you can partner with people that don't have the particular skill or resource you do. And I, I think there are, there are opportunities all around this this part of agriculture for new enterprises, for new entrepreneurs, and ways to enter agriculture. If you're a landlord, you're thinking long term about your legacy, then improving your soil, helping a young person get into agriculture, that's a powerful statement for the community and for agriculture. So, you know, not, not just for landlords, this is for producers and landlords across the spectrum, young, young operators, people new, and established operations. Good advice, thanks. And Michael? Um, I'd say for me, it would be, um, like say if it's your first time doing the cover crops, um, again, the winter, overwintering small grain, like rye, triticale, wheat, the four soybeans, you know, after corn, the four soybeans, that to me seems like pretty foolproof like it always works great for us um, it's a great way to 
kind of you know have the training wheels on and before you start doing some of the uh, uh, more diverse mixes or anything like that where you have to worry maybe a lot more about uh, carbon to nitrogen ratios given trouble for corn or things like that I think the other thing I would just say is uh, you know when you start okay yeah don't put the entire barn into it you know it's, it's a big change yeah, you need to start small, but don't start too small. You know, start small enough that you can wrap your head around it, but also start big enough that you have some skin in the game that you want to make it work instead of like, oh, it's a little three acres with trees all around it back in the timber and no one can see it from the road. Okay, well then it fails to be like, well, I'm just going to give up. Whereas, you know, if it's somewhere either A, it might, people will see if you're, you know, maybe not doing such a great job, or B, maybe if it's going to affect you in your pocketbook a little bit, you know, you'll want to at least try to make it work. And so I think that's sometimes on a lot of that is just changing the mindset of, you know, just instead of saying, well, it's different if it failed. Well, no, it's just that you need to change the way that you approach it in order to get it to work. Thanks. Sean, how about you? What advice do you give a, a newcomer to cover crops? Well, I, I mean, I have tons of data that I can back things up with and, and share with people. But, you know, I try to encourage people that they don't have to do it all at once. I mean, if you're considering this, well, then take one farm or, you know, one quarter section or, or 40 acres or whatever, and then just get started. That's the, it's kind of like, uh, I have an orchard too. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. You know, so you just got to start at some point, but then you've got to measure it. You've got to measure it so you can manage it and, and make comparisons. The, the the pitfalls that I would caution people on is number one, uh, be flexible, and number two, don't expect everything to be perfect in the first year. This is not a get rich quick scheme or fix something now scheme. This is it takes time. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing is. And I haven't done a good job of this, but I'll, I'll share a quick two minute story if you'll allow me. You bet. But I was coming home. So in the last four weeks, I've been at three of these conferences. And I was coming home from two, or from no-till on the plains two weeks ago. And I, I was thinking, man, I go to this stuff, I get all fired up, I have all these great ideas and I come home and if I implement 20% of what I was thinking of at the conference, I'm doing really good. And, uh, so literally driving home from Wichita that night, I had the dome light on in the pickup and a, and a notebook on the console, and I was writing down the names of people in my region that think like this, whether they're you know, cover cropping, no-tilling, regenerative farming, regenerative grazing, and it didn't, it didn't take long to get a half dozen names, but that's scattered across three counties. This is not really widespread in my area. And I sent out a text a few days later at six o'clock in the morning to this group of guys saying, I want to establish monthly meetings to where we get together in each other's fields, we hold each other accountable, we challenge each other, we stimulate thought, and it didn't take five minutes for every single person to respond back and say, absolutely, let's do this, I'm in. And you've got to establish community around you to where you can maintain stamina and you can weather those challenging times. Because if you're on an island, frustration and disappointment can set in pretty quick. Good answer, thank you. Keith? I second that. I have my bunch I call and we shoot ideas. So when the time people ask me, you know, how to start, I tell them, add cover crops, don't change anything else in your system. Use your same fertility program, your same chemical program, plant the same things you've been doing. Um, just keep going down that line, and it takes about three years before you start really seeing any changes in the soil. It used to take 10 years for right? cover crops. In three years, if you got something growing <coughs> year round, you'll see changes in three years. And I tell them after three years, then start slowly weaning yourself off. And just do that in, in parts of your field, just like the other gentleman said. You know, just do a, do a little bit when you start your weaning and make sure that is going to work. Because that's, just take your time. That's, we, we goofed it up for a hundred and some years. It's, what's three years? That ain't nothing. <laughs> <laughs> These folks have some good responses. That's excellent. So what, uh, what question, who wants to ask the first question to the group? Who's got a, who's got a question? I've got some more, but 
I know there's some questions. I got a question. Yes. If you were to start a custom application or a custom business where you were, I have a lot of people tell me the same thing they can't get, they don't have time to get messages. Is there a average cost factor that, that anyone maybe around Missouri or, or anywhere, I guess, that could kind of give you a starting point? So who wants to who wants to tackle that one first? Anybody? I don't. Ben, you I, go ahead. Ben. Well, I don't. I don't know if there's a, a set price. I. What was the question? Okay. So the question uh, was really around uh, establishing uh, a business to help with. So, or I, I don't know if there's a set price to say hang your shingle out and say, I'll charge this. Everybody's gonna have a different choice in the seed category, what kind of mixes you wanna plant. So the seed cost would certainly vary by the client and by the farm. Um, so you're down, you're talking about the cost of drilling, for example. You're, um, I will say that when the combine pulls into a field in our place, there's a drill right behind you. We've, we've, dis we've come to the conclusion we need the drill moving Whenever the combine's moving, the drill's moving. Not not finish harvest and then think about this. It's it needs to be done promptly. So if you're going to be in a bit custom business, all that tells me is you better have a drill that's prepared to get over some acres. Or if you're going to work for me, you're going to have to dedicate your offer. You're going to have to commit to being prompt to serve my needs. So if you're going to do that with a number of clients, probably going to have to have a big drill and be prepared to move. And and that's all doable. You know, I mean, you just just scale it up. So, um, we have any thoughts? I would say cultivate a relationship with one or two different cover crop seed dealers to where you can be that one-stop shop. If they've never done it before, right. Right. you can you can be that bridge to where you may not be making recommendations, but you can say, hey, I know who to talk to and I know where to get it. And yeah. I would bet if you're looking to be a custom dealer or custom planter, that seed dealer may even give you a discount because you're impacting a lot of acres and recommending them. The second thing is, I don't know what other states have, but Kansas Ag Statistics Service, uh, that website has custom rates published. You know, they're usually a year old, but they're pretty accurate. And I personally charge myself on my spreadsheets what it would cost to hire it done. I may be able to get it done cheaper with my equipment, but I charge myself on paper like I was hiring it all out. So then you can arrive at a fair price to charge. So. One of the things that I really enjoy about this process of seeding is that there's no precision to it. Yeah. There is so much precision in everything else, but here's an area where you can relax and do some of the things that are kind of fun, if you like that. So when we blend seed, for example, don't get too techy about it. I use my grain, my way, wake my cart, my grain cart. It's got a scale on it, so I'll take a tote of rye and dump in there and a tote of whatever else while I'm dumping it in I'll throw in you know estimate pounds or bags of radish or, or rape or whatever it is you want to put in the mix you just start dumping those in just alternate blend them in however you want auger it out of that grain cart into you know depending on how you move seed in bulk to the field put it in boxes put it in you know your transport wagon whatever you use that's enough mixing you don't need to get too carried away about accuracy here. I love it. You can just kind of dump it in and plant it. And I've never had any issue 